Hi, it's product review time again, and it's the Agilent 34461A Bench Multimeter, a replacement for the venerable old 34401A uh, meter, which is now about 20 years old or so. This one's a beauty, huge big graphical display, lower price point, haha, <laughs> looks and sounds really good on paper. Let's see if it stacks up in the review. Let's get straight to it. And here it is, the Agilent 34461A, six and a half digit, Multimeter. Now the 34460A, of course, are going to look and uh, feel identical um, on this. Just a few uh, features missing and a few uh, minor, uh, uh, you know, slightly less in terms of um, specification and stuff like that. But in terms, yeah, they're essentially, um, the review will be pretty much identical for both. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I've already done a teardown of this thing. It'll be linked in down below. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Yes, this thing is designed and manufactured absolutely first class, as you'd expect. Now, Agilent went uh, to a lot of trouble to uh, explain in some of their videos on the YouTube channel that uh, this was um, uh, designed by a lot of the same people that designed the 34401A, all those, you know, 20 plus uh, years ago, and the 3458A, and how they have, you know, a ton of experience in this sort of area. So, and how they didn't goof it up, and they're very proud of it that it is a proper replacement for the 34401A. Anyway, uh, that remains to be seen, but it does look and feel very, very good. High quality, top quality uh, rubber surrounds and everything. The tilting bale, um, it, it works okay. I'm not a huge fan of these style uh, tilting bales. So really, if you've got this permanently on a, um, a bench, uh, like a uh, shelf arrangement, um, instrument rack, uh, for example, instrument shelf, um, you know, you just leave it uh, folded under like that. But, uh, you know, the angles are pretty good on it. Um, it does make a very good, uh, just, you know, a bench multimeter, if you're just sitting on your bench like this, or whether or not it's on an instrument shelf, it feels pretty good. And, and of course, that rubber surround just comes off, and you've got your traditional um, standard uh, mounting points there for your uh, rack mount. Um, kit. You can get a rack mount kit and it put it in a 19-inch uh, rack mount, so not a problem. So it's equally at home on the bench and in the rack. So I do really like the look and feel of this thing. It really does feel like a quality bit of kit. Trust me, fantastic. And the uh, colour scheme, the button layout's fantastic. The huge um, colour graphic display, as we'll take a look at. Uh, soft button um, uh, power switch, not a uh, full, but they've got a mechanical uh, front and rear uh, terminal measurement. Rear terminals, of course, you use for uh, system type measurements. But if you're using it in a uh, traditional bench, or uh, instrument shelf uh, scenario, you're going to be using the front panel banana terminals, yes, all fully uh, recessed, and we'll take a look at the probes that come with it. It's got um, both 3 amps and 10 amp input jacks. Now, the 3 amp one is for uh, traditional backward compatibility for the 3441A, uh, but uh, they do recommend using the uh, 10 amp one. It can give you uh, greater accuracy in some respects. You've got to read the specs in that detail. Of course, it's got um, four wire resistance measurement. So for your basic volts, ohms, uh, diodes, you're going to be using these two. But if you want the four wire ohms, you're going to use the two sense terminals here. And the layout is quite good. I don't mind it at all. You know, all single button interface to all your major measurement functions. DC volt, AC, uh, two wire ohms. Yes, you have to um, shift to get to your uh, current, the AC current, but you know, they are limited to how many buttons they can put on here. Dedicated null button, fantastic. Probably didn't need the dedicated temperature button, could have shift functioned that or something, but you know, eh, it's neither here nor there, really. Continuity mode, fantastic. Just a single button, you don't have to shift that. So if you're using it in traditional uh, bench, you know, as everyday use uh, multimeter, then the continuity's right there. Fantastic frequency measurement, run stop mode, and then you've basically got all your data uh, type stuff. Your uh, single shot, uh, the null button, fantastic, separate. Um, then your acquire mode, your display mode, uh, all your selection buttons, and the range button. I like it. They've just got up down measurement ranges. So you push range once, you go into manual ranging, up and down. Fantastic. And your soft button. So really well laid out. No complaints about that at all. 
and of course uh, front panel uh, USB so you can just stick your key straight in there you don't have to fumble around on the back you want to save uh, screenshots capture data stuff like that it's sitting up on your uh, rack there and well yeah you just plug it in save your data pull it back out go to your PC not a problem now on the rear of the unit here, here's where it's going to vary depending on whether you get the low end uh, 60 model or the 61. I got the 61 with the optional GPIB. Yes, even on the high end 61 model, the GPIB is still optional extra. User installable though, um, I'm not sure how much the actual uh, module costs for GPIB, but if you need it, you pay it of course. Both models come standard with uh, USB but LAN is optional extra on the uh, 3460A but because it's actually soldered directly onto the board that connector I don't know how it's sort of you know um, user replaceable uh, kind of thing so yeah I'm not exactly sure what's going on there we've got uh, external uh, trigger here we've got uh, the VM comparator uh, output and uh, the 3461A has the rear terminals the 60 a you won't get that at all and yes it does run microsoft windows embedded ce 6.0 and for those people who complain about that well you don't even notice it you don't know it's running windows embedded ce there's some very good reasons uh, to do to actually uh, use an operating system like this to take care of the high level functionality and stuff like that and no it's not going to get infected with viruses and everything else oh Man, really, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD going around about um, items, you know, uh, test equipment which runs uh, Windows. But this isn't Windows. It's Windows Embedded CE. Totally different beast. And yes, by the way, made in Malaysia. Now, of course, one of the big complaints a lot of people will have is that this thing just takes too long to boot up. And, well, yes, I agree, it takes a long time. Now, I've been told my one has actually uh, pre-release uh, firmware in it, so let's time it. I'm told the release version is shorter, but somebody on the forum has one, and they said it was 52 seconds. Here we go. And yep, my one actually took around about that 52 seconds as well. So I don't know what the deal is there. Uh, maybe some firmware improvements in the future will uh, fix the boot up time. But yes, if you're using this as an everyday use multimeter and you like to switch your instruments off and on, well, you know, and use them instantly, well, you know, tough titties. Um, you know, this one may not be for you if that's your overriding requirement is for it to be instant on. It's not instant on. It's going to take at least 52 seconds. But an instrument of this class is designed for highly accurate measurements. And, of course, you can't just switch it on and expect to get those highly accurate measurements. It's got to be on for, like, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, something like that, before um, the specs are actually uh, valid in these things, really. So, uh, you know, eh, if you want to switch it on and use it, it's not the best. And, yes, I've got a nice little... Uh, power on message programmed into there for uh, those who get the movie reference now the screen how does it work on the angle um, it, this is uh, dead on I've got uh, fixed exposure on the camera so um, I'm smack in front of it like that let's go to the side you might get some uh, you know some uh, glare from my uh, lab lights here and uh, stuff like that but you know even right at the side it's pretty darn good. You can still read it. Let me, sorry, let me get rid of the, uh, the numerical display is very, very big. I really like it. So there it is from the side. So from the side, it's, you know, you can read it from almost any angle. Let's go up now. Not a problem. Look at this. Look at this. We're practically right above it and you can still read that. Not a problem. Right down as you would uh, get um, for example, on your um, if you had it up on an instrument shelf like that, yeah, it does change the uh, background. Our background is now um, vanished, or at least it has to my eyes. It may not have to the camera there, but uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. The background color is uh, vanished, but that is a really good display, folks. Let me tell you. And if you don't like the uh, colors on the display, well, you can actually change them. You can press uh, Shift, go into the Utility menu here, System Setup, 
user settings and you've got some display options of course you can actually switch the display off like this and it, it does actually have a uh, timeout where it, a screensaver so you can turn the uh, screensaver um, off or on and the uh, brightness currently set to 100% there um, not a problem but it's got two color schemes so you can get rid of that blue background like that so if you get that one and have a look at that down at the lower angle eh, some people might prefer that I don't know and of course why would you want to turn the display off well um, you know you might have it in a uh, test um, instrument rack or uh, something like that some sort of uh, automated production test system it's all remotely controlled via GPIB and you just don't want anything um, on the displays and it looks like by default when you know, first power this thing on you first get the first user experience is that it does give you the full six and a half digit display which is uh, excellent but you'll notice that there's actually a space in here I'm personally not a big fan of that but I can understand why they've done that because it delineates the um, uh, engineering uh, notation portion of this so we're on the millivolt range at the moment of course and that's one uh, uh, one microvolt there so that space just delineates the difference between the microvolts and the nanovolts down here but of course if you don't like that you can actually change it so you can actually go down here into um, the uh, separator down in here it can be none there we go we've just gotten rid of it if you don't like it or you can Look at that, put a coma on. I really don't like that one, so we'll, we'll stick to the space, shall we, the default. And the um, uh, period, uh, the decimal point here, you can change that to a period or a coma. I mean, a coma? Give me a break, give me my decimal point. Thank you very much. But of course, I am aware that in uh, some countries, they do actually, you know, uh, do these things uh, differently. So that's why they've added just for uh, some world um, standard compliance, I guess. The beeper off and on. Now the beeper I turn off, but I still get a slight, a tiny little beep when I press the buttons. It doesn't, so the beeper has got nothing to do with the button beep. And to show that they've really thought about uh, 34401A backward compatibility, here's the um, SCPI or uh, Skippy ID as it's known, and you can actually change that to make it fully, absolutely backward compatible so your old software doesn't crap itself. It can be the 34401A. Thank you very much. So your old test system software wouldn't know any different that it's talking to the new 34461A. Very nice. So also in the utility menu here, system setup, you've got that power on message, which there we go, I just added in that. I want to add it in the full version, but it's limited to, um, I don't know, X number of characters over here, so I couldn't fit the full message that I wanted in there. Had to shorten it. So that's all in the system setup here. Let's have a look in test admin. And the self-test here, you can do a quick test or a full test. Full test, you've got to disconnect everything. Let's run a full test. Boom, performing full test, self-test passed. Woohoo! That was the full test. Jeez, watch the quick test. Not much quicker. And of course, you can calibrate this thing, but then it says uh, locked cow string. Uh, has it been calibrated 237 times? I don't know. Um, but you need a secure code required to perform the uh, calibration. So let's, and it can measure the internal um, temp or the ambient temp, 24 degrees. And it's got quite a bit of uh, security built in. Here it is. Um, the LAN, we can actually uh, disable the sockets and the telnet and the web and all that sort of stuff. And uh, GPIB, we can lock it. USB front and rear, we can lock all that. Ah, fantastic. Now, if you're wondering what this NISPOM sanitize here is, um, it's a US military uh, thing or something like that. That means uh, it just securely uh, erases all of the data on here. So, now, curiously, there's install license here. And... Uh, Really, um, I'm not sure what licenses they're talking about because I'm not aware of this thing having any software licenses, maybe for the future. And you can update the uh, firmware here, but they claim that's a restricted function and, uh, well, you need the secure code. Maybe it's in the, uh, you know, the programming service manual or something like that. It's probably like four zeros or something. And if you go into manage files here, you can see like all the internal uh, screenshots and screenshots and uh, stuff that you've actually uh, captured here. And yes, we can just save the screen as a PNG or a bitmap. Very nice. And it defaults to, you know, the file name screen one and boom, we can just save screen. Hello? No file specified. Oh, what? So I'm just going to quickly check the uh, screen capture capability of this. I'll plug in my USB key. Didn't tell me. I actually uh, plugged it in, but 
anyway, um, let's go into uh, manage files here. So if you want to get a, a uh, screen capture, you just go into uh, utility down in here, manage files and save screen. Now one thing I don't like is that it really didn't detect this USB key and it stored that screenshot internally. If you want to change that, you've got to go into store, then you've got to go into browse, see how it's got path internal, and you've got to choose browse here, and then you've got to go down and select external. That's hopeless. That really is. Store state, I don't want that. I was, oh, hang on. Utility. System, uh, bleh, where are we? Um, uh, manage files, there we go. Save screen, ah, oh, would have been nice maybe if they had a shift screenshot um, key or something like that, but oh, I don't, don't necessarily blame them for not having that though. But there we go, we're going to save that to external. Alright, now I can load that on my PC. And yes, I did just go and check that, and uh, not a problem, saved it as a 7 uh, kilobyte PNG file, and added the uh, date time down the bottom as well, which you don't normally get on the screen, which is uh, really quite good. And unfortunately, you do lose that external uh, setting when you reboot the thing. How annoying! Especially if you're saving stuff to USB key all the time. Urgh. And one neat feature for uh, screen captures or for other um, stuff, if you've got, you know, 10 of these things in a uh, rack, for example, you know, a test system, uh, actually monitoring uh, stuff or capturing data, you can just put a label on here. If we just go into uh, the display here, we can turn a label on and it puts a big, nice big label there. And there it is. Beautiful. Huge, big text that you can read from halfway across the room. And by the way, even with that smaller uh, display there, um, I could read that thing from the other wall of this lab, so, you know, five metres away. Pretty darn good. And this is where we can change our number of uh, digits to. You can see it's updating like twice a second or three times a second or something like that here. Not sure, but uh, eh, sorry, if we just go into uh, display and we can uh, digit mask auto. There we go. It's automatic at the moment, but we can force it to six and a half digit mode. Or we can force it to five and a half digit mode, four and a half, and... Three and a half. It's going to update really quick in three and a half digit mode, let me tell you. And check this out, right? I've got it in auto uh, digit mode, six and a half digit display mode. DC volts, check out the update rate there. Switch it to AC volts. Look at that. Seems to be same resolution, but seems to be much quicker updating. And of course, we're in uh, auto trigger mode at the moment, and we can just stop that at any time and just, you know, bang. Uh, run stop or we can just press uh, single trigger and then just take a reading bang 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 so having a dedicated uh, button for that fantastic and if we go into temperature here um, unfortunately it doesn't support just your standard um, you know K type uh, thermocouple for example it uh, supports uh, two wire um, RTD four wire both two and four wire RTD two and four wire thermistor as well but you know no standard k-type thermocouple and it doesn't come with any temperature probes now if we go into our basic DC volts uh, measurement mode here we can actually uh, select our input impedance um, by the way uh, 10 meg or auto and you'll see in auto it of course goes into it you know gig ohms um, high Z there it is it's got it on the display um, high impedance uh, input mode so you're going to see that charge build up and yeah there you go, you see the uh, display completely build up until it probably goes uh, overload. But that's really handy to be able to select that because sometimes you don't, you know, that's annoying. You don't want that. You just want, give me 10 meg, damn it. Um, and uh, auto zero in, uh, off or on if you want to auto zero your reading. Generally, you're going to leave that on. And your aperture number of power line cycles. It defaults to 10, but of course we can do, uh, you know, we can make our display uh, faster, but you uh, lose some resolution there with the lower power line cycles. Bingo, we've just gained an extra uh, digit. That's basically eliminating the um, 50 hertz uh, mains or 60 hertz. It's going to detect which uh, mains frequency you're using in your particular country. And of course, you can go all the way up to 100, and it's going to be really, really slow, but the accuracy is going to be much, much better. And as I said, we can uh, auto and manual range this thing. Um, we can uh, do it via the menu here, or the dedicated buttons over here. So you can just, bang, there it is, manual, one volt, it tells you, fantastic. So you can just up and down those at any time you like, and range puts it back into auto. Perfect. And of course, a lot of people will complain, well, where's the second 
display on this thing. A lot of other Agilent uh, bench meters have a second display. So you can uh, have like a, you know, DC volts primary and AC as a secondary display or something like that. Well, this one doesn't have it at all. So if you're looking for something like that, um, forget it. This meter isn't for you. It's not a dual display meter. Why they've done that? My guess is that uh, full backward comp compatibility for the 3401A. That was their driving design decision behind everything in terms of this instrument. And I guess they just couldn't do it for some reason. One really neat feature is the DC volt ratio measurement. You switch that on and basically what you get is a ratio, like you're not actually getting, um, you know, a 10, like a voltage measurement anymore. You're actually getting a ratio difference of the voltage between channel one here and channel two. So you've effectively got a second channel on there now. So if you hook it up, I've now got, for example, it's just jumping all over the place because one of the uh, terminals is uh, floating. But if we uh, connect that up, there we go. That's the difference between the two voltages on the, I mean, ideally, it should be exactly one. So I'm guessing the, uh, why that's not precisely one, well, the contacts aren't exactly on the same point. There's a minuscule amount of current uh, flowing into the 10 mega ohm input there, so presumably that'll go higher if we put auto Z interface on. Yep, there we go. It gets closer to one because our input impedance, so there's less current flowing through the wires, no matter how minuscule it actually is. And bingo. There, there we go. Spot on. Excellent. Now one feature that's worth a bit of a look, it's hi hidden away here, probe hold in the shift function. Look at this. Ah, we've got ourselves a couple of different readings here. Look at this, right? I'm hooked up a 9 volt battery here. Let's disconnect that. It's like the uh, touch hold uh, capability that you're used to on the flute, for example. And look at that. We can store. Beautiful. Ah, oh, come on, give me a slightly different reading. Ah. Meter's too good for its own. Good. And there we go. We can store, looks like, how, how many? I don't know, seven, eight different touch hold readings. That is great. That is, yeah, eight, eight. That's it. Does it shuffle? Yeah, it looks like it shuffles them up. So it gives you the last eight readings. Oh, fantastic. And if you don't like that beep, um, you can turn that off and on and probe hold off and on as well. And if you turn that off, and it uh, holds the values back in there when you go back. That is a great feature. I love that. That's a winner. And it gives you the live uh, display as well. I did like, ah, unbelievable. And of course, the uh, last one, of course, in a nice big display up the top there. There we go. Fantastic. And you can tell that feature was implemented by somebody who uses touch hold a lot. And they just went, Oh, I'd love to have, like, you know, uh, last half a dozen readings or something. That'd be fantastic. And that's just beautiful. How can you fault that? And that brings us to the continuity buzzer. How good is it? Let's test it. Here we go. Ah, oh, probe hold not supported for ratio, current, uh, continuity, diode, or temp. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, fair enough. We've got to turn that mode off. But there we go. Oh, I can get it to miss it. There we go. So it could be quicker, but but yeah, that's not bad. It is the latching type, and yeah, it's okay. Not 100%, but good enough. And it's probably just loud enough. It's not super loud, but considering it's for uh, bench use, pretty good. I like it. Now, speaking of continuity and the probes these are the probes that came with it not sure if these are the same ones that come with the lower model one but these are very very nice the uh, 34138a set very nice uh, reasonably sharp you know not the sharpest probes i've felt but still pretty darn good i like them they come with you know the probe protection uh, uh, caps and all that uh, sort of jazz they are uh, thousand volt uh, 15 amp cat 2 rated yes this is a cat 2 uh, rated meter by the way I uh, forgot to mention that it's mount uh, 300 volt cat 2 it's mentioned on the uh, front panel so you know these bench meters are never designed for you know high overload use this one has been designed to survive overloads but it's not designed to be go out in the field and measure you know plant and equipment and stuff like that it's designed for test instrument racks and lab use where you know you're just not going to get that sort of you know cat 3 cat 4 scenario so 
not a problem. But these probes are very, very nice indeed. Beautiful um, silicon uh, flexible test leads on them. Really like it. And I got a whole bunch of accessories. Here we go. Look at that. We can uh, plug our probe into there like that. Fits beautifully over that. Look at that. Look at the protection you get in there. And we've got ourselves a little, that's a hook. There we go. So yeah, I'd prefer it maybe if that was an easy hook. I don't like the sort of right angle hook in that, but still they are excellent quality. And the other ones are these puppies. Long, they come with protection uh, caps. Long, thin, flexible, very sharp probes on these things. So let's plug our probe in here. There we go. Look at that. It's it kind of flexible. It's not super flexible, but you know, it really allows you to get into very tight and fine areas. Very nice. <laughs> and I'm pretty surprised and disappointed for a you know a meter of this uh, capability that the only option in your continuity mode is beeper on or off. Like you don't even have the ability to set you know the uh, threshold value for your continuity buzzer. I mean, you, you get that in the much cheaper, you know, uh, handheld agilent meters. So I don't know why they haven't added it to this. Laziness, I guess. And another capability we've got is to show statistics. And we can do this in the math mode. We can just go shift math like that. And we can turn, well, we can uh, turn our null value um, off and on. So there we go, we can actually permanently display that. So when we've nulled something out, that's rather handy. DB, DBM um, stuff. But yeah, oh, you can set your reference values for all your DBM stuff. Pretty good. And um, But statistics is what we're interested in. There it is. It um, makes your display smaller once again. I don't know why they continue to put this um, gap down the bottom if you're not going to have anything there. And you can clear them and reset them at any time. Very nice. And as we'll see, that math capability, these statistics, can be overlaid on top of our histograms and our uh, trend charts as well. And of course, another big thing is uh, in the math menu, you can set your limits as well. Bingo, look, our display just went from blue to red because we're outside our uh, specified limits here. Fantastic. And we can set our span and center. We can have it uh, beep, whether or not it uh, beeps when it, um, it goes into... Oh, there we go. It should now shut up if I maybe muck around with the inputs there with my finger. Yeah, it doesn't beep. If I do it oh, again, there we go. And... Yeah, it's really quite nice. We can uh, program those uh, limits in, and once again, these limits, these math capability, can be done on the uh, trend chart and the histogram as well. Check out this insanity. If we choose our low, like we can choose a low high value or a center span value, uh, depending on what um, error, uh, you know, what type of limits you actually want. But look, let's look at this. It pops it up, and it highlights that first digit, and we can go across here, right? But it, it like gigavolts, look, right? It's absolutely ridiculous. Gigavolts, and this changes the scale like this, megavolts, kilovolts, right? And we can go milli, micro, nano, pico, femto. Where's our, you know, where's Atto? Oh, geez, you know, feature fail there. Ah, ridiculous. Why add that? So I really don't care for the way that they're shifting the digit there. I mean, it's a fixed... Like, I expected, when I went into this mode, I expected for this cursor key to actually shift my, um, you know, my cursor along like that, along the digit on the fixed range, but it doesn't, it shifts it. So let's say we want to 0.1 millivolts there as our low limit, then we've got to go into, where is it, millivolts, there we go, we're point, no, 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 hang on, no, we've got to go into microvolts, and then we've got to go 1, hang on, there we go. 0.1, there it is, it's gone blue now, so that's our 0.1, uh, yeah, 0.1 millivolts minus, it's, just, ugh, it's finicky, I don't like the way they've implemented that at all. But anyway, we can now operate that, and you'll see that when I short the probes together, bang, we're within the limits, not a problem at all, but once we go outside that, bang, bang, whoop. And, of course, it tells you the number of uh, failures as well, and, well, both the high and low, low failures, very, very nice. I do like, once it's set up, I do like the way it works. And with this status display here, it's not like a live thing. It's not telling us, it just tells us that there has been a fail, but it's a bit redundant when you have the fail counts here. So I don't kind of understand that really. And of course, we can add our label there with our limits. So we can put our label on this. Fantastic. Oh, 
Beautiful. Now let's do a simple uh, check with a 9 volt battery here, how fast this thing actually uh, responds and whether or not it overshoots at all. So I'm just going to go really solid probe into that battery, bam, straight to it, almost to the least significant digit. That's impressive. And I should be able to repeat that. Yeah, look at that. It's not just a fluke. No pun intended there. <laughs> That's fantastic. Look at that. Yep, I like that. Get great measurement confidence with this thing. As you'd expect, with not only an Agilent meter, but one that's designed to replace the venerable 34401A. I mean, everyone, you know, has had absolute confidence in that thing for the last 20 years. And this one looks no different. But curiously, though, I've now got it fixed to a manual 10 volt range. And check this out. See, we've got an intermediate reading in there. So maybe it's because it's not auto ranging anymore, it's actually able to get that additional reading in there faster. But of course it does, it doesn't overshoot or anything like that. It does actually uh, settle, you know, it goes bang, pretty much bang straight onto the reading. So that's still pretty good, but it does give you that intermediate value in manual range mode. Whereas it doesn't do that. If we go into auto, here we go. There we go. Auto doesn't do that at all. So eh, I guess leave it in auto mode. And if I try that again with uh, 0.2 power line cycles, look at that, straight to it. Excellent. Let's go in there, 0.02, so we're really screaming now. Look at that. Very nice. Oh, I like it. Ohms, let's check it out. Goes up to 100 mega ohm range, by the way. Here we go. Boom, that's pretty darn quick. That is super quick. I'm impressed with that. Look at that. And that includes a relay, a manual relay switch as well, if you heard that. Fantastic. So that beats the pants off um, almost any, uh, you know, handheld multimeter. And it has to manually switch that relay in, which takes time. I mean, that's probably most of the time in there. If it didn't have to switch that relay, it would probably do it near instantaneously. And just remember, we've done all these tests in the uh, auto digit mask uh, range as well where it automatically chooses the number of digits i mean if we switch to say four and a half uh digit mode there bang look at that you know it, it there's there's sort of no pen you're not paying any penalty for using that six and a half digit well let's fix it to six and a half digit mode look at that you really are not paying a penalty there at all for that extra resolution fantastic all right, time to get a bit medieval on its ass and see if this thing can survive 240 volts on the ohms range. By the way, here we are, AC volts. I'm probing my uh, directly on the mains outlet here under my bench. That's uh, a bit high today, 247 uh, volts AC, still within uh, spec. We've got AC uh, filtering here, of course. We can have uh, uh, 200 hertz. And, uh, well, <laughs> you know, like, obviously, uh, we're not going to read it because we're trying to read 50 hertz here. So that's no good. But uh, there we go. And we've got 3 hertz. So that's a nice little touch to add that uh, filter in. We've got our auto range there. But what I want to... I don't like this extra digit out here. What the hell is going on here? Get rid of that. That's ridiculous. Bugger that off. Anyway, I want to see if this thing can survive 240 volts on the ohms range and then come good again. Let's try it. Will the magic smoke escape? Two wire ohms. Overload. Not a problem. Let's go back. And I'm sure it's still within spec. We haven't damaged a thing because Agilent have actually um, uh, designed it to survive overloads like that. Brilliant. It works. Listen to this though, right? 240 volt mains, DC volts. The auto range relays are just going crazy. What's going on there? Don't like the sound of that. Now one significant change they've made from the 34401A is in the uh, diode mode here. The old one used to be uh, 1 volt maximum um, uh, test voltage. This one is now 5 volts. And of course that allows you to test um, you know, modern uh, LEDs like this white LED here. So, look at the resolution we're getting on that. Very, very nice. Um, but, of course, uh, that could have um, some implications for existing test 
uh, systems where I don't know it could pretend that uh, higher open circuit voltage could potentially uh, damage it or turn on uh, junctions or uh, something like that that it's not supposed to so anyway just something to consider there is no option at all to um, change that back to the one volt range and if we have a look at the uh, DC amps mode here, 100 microamps um, uh, range which they've added over the 34401E, very nice, it didn't have that before. So a six and a half digit uh, re resolution on this thing, that gives us 0.1 nanovolts resolution. I've got it hooked up to my Keithley uh, current source here, set to uh, 10 uh, microamps and I can just dial that down a decade. There we go, that's to one microamp and uh, there we go, we're down to 100 nanoamps. And I can even get lower than that. There we go. That is one nanoamp. And of course, when this thing uh, says it's six and a half digits, well, how many count is that? It doesn't actually imply um, any, you know, the actual uh, count value. Well, in this case, let's check it out, okay? We're on the one milliamp range here, so you th might think it goes to point, you know, it goes to one milliamp maximum, but it doesn't. It actually has some over range on this thing so let's actually try it and see how far it goes before it switches up a range I'm gonna to have to actually go up another digit there there we go hey, there we go we just switched to so it looks like it's about 1.2 you can over range this thing and will it switch back down if I tweak that back not quite if I tweak it back another digit no it's got some hysteresis there it's not gonna there we go it switched down when I went to one milliamp but uh, there you go you'd expect some hysteresis on that but there you go it can measure up to 1.2 any over that let me tweak the third decimal place oh yeah there we go it just went over when I went to 1.2 so this is a 1.2 million count meter fantastic and you'll notice that uh, we're on the 3 amp range here. If we want to actually measure higher than that, we have to fix, uh, switch to the fixed 10 amp range. And that is actually fixed. If we switch that over, there it is, fixed 10 amp. So there it is. We have to actually switch our probe over. And of course, we get no more um, low resolution stuff. We can still measure our milliamp, but it's a fixed 10 amp range. Oh, well. So you almost have to ask, um, you know, why did they bother adding that fixed 10 amp range you know an extra socket on there relay switch in and and stuff you know why actually do that they must have had because 10 amps isn't a huge amount more than uh, 3 amps I guess they must have had some um you know or there was some particular uh, customer requirement to go uh, slightly beyond 3 amps so they've gone to all that effort just to extend it and here's where we get into some of the neat display and analysis uh, aspects and uh, uh, data logging of this meter built in enabled by the big graphical display here. Now what I've got is I've got my microcurrent hooked up, nothing on the input. So we're effectively looking at the noise here and you can see, you know, it's just we're just talking a couple of, you know, digits down in here. It's just jumping around randomly. But by display, going into uh, our display menu here, uh, we'll look at the uh, bar graph meter later, but now we can have a look at, say, the trend chart, which shows this, the value over time. Now, it's not showing anything at the moment, it's showing a flat line, but if we auto scale that using the auto scale once, check it out. We get a rolling display of this thing versus time. Now, it shows the last minute here which I'll get to, and uh, it, we can see the value jumping around. We can see the noise in there. It's like a roll-in display you might be used to on your oscilloscope, uh, for example. They can do a roll uh, display like this as well, and it's great for showing how things trend and if you're trimming stuff, how they adjust or how they adjust with temperature and all that sort of stuff. Now, as uh, similar as we saw before, um, you've got the uh, low-high values here for your uh, scale here or you can do a center span value as well so you can send a set a center value and then how much you want to span it depends on how you want to enter it how you want to uh, think about that sort of thing the scales now you might think that this uh, uh, entry thing works the same as before it doesn't this one actually allows you to move the cursor like that and jump it down to microvolts look, look, look at that see we can change that 220 like that and we can go in there and we can change that to Look, 19.99, and see, and then once you obviously get into the decimal places there, it gets really annoying to, you know, see your range. So it's better to have, 
you know, a nice even range like that. So, you know, it just doesn't confuse you. So you can choose center or span, really quite nice. Uh, vertical, manual, you can do uh, auto, uh, scaling, and uh, a default value, of course, but we don't want that. We want auto. There it is. And that works really well. We've got some extra uh, dead space over here. It's not uh, scaling the window based on um, the... Uh, you know, the digits entered, it sort of seems to cater for the maximum uh, number of decimal places there, and then just has all this dead space over here. They should be utilizing that. There should be, may, it'd be nice if they had a, you know, a, this button here that said, you know, go to full screen or something like that, and bang, it just, you know, um, expanded to full screen. I mean, you know, just little firmware issues like that, but I like how they've got the live display up here, of course, the live numerical display, really quite nice, and of course we can stop that at any time and then just do a single um, issue, thing like that, and of course it takes into account that we've now stopped that for a longer period of time, and it's putting in that long time period there, so I like to waffle on, so we'll see a nice big gap there now when I single space that out, there we go, and we can restart that, and it all carries off where we left off. And the other good thing is, is that we can go back to the trend, uh, go back to our number display here at any time, and then go back in, and we haven't lost any of our data. Trend um, chart mode, by the way, only available in the 6.1 model. Not av This option is not available in the 6.0 option. That's really essentially the only uh, software feature that's not available in the 6.0. But yeah, this is really handy for seeing, um, you know, in this case, short-term drift. And by default, it only shows the last minute there. So why it shows zero, zero seconds there, I've got, you know, no idea. That's just dumb, you know. Say 60 seconds or just put a minute or something like that. Or, my, you know, minus a minute. I don't know. It's dumb. Anyway, um, they're the only options for changing that horizontal... Uh, scale there is the recent so recent is the last minute would it be nice to show like have an option to show all oh, last 10 minutes or something like that five minutes or you know to be able to change that scale somehow but uh i can't see a way to actually uh, do that or you can utilize all of your readings like that so you can now see that you know, presumably it'll go up to the entire 10,000 readings and then it will roll and uh, scale you know you'll always be able to get if you've already hit 10,000 readings, um, that's the other thing. It doesn't show you on here how many uh, readings you've got. Unlike the histogram display, which we'll see, it doesn't show it at all. I'd like to see a, uh, you know, if you're going to display all, well, tell me how many are in there. I don't know. Come on. Give me a break. Add that feature. Anyway, it's got the elapsed time, which is really quite good. And I guess you could work it out based on the sample rate, but you don't know what the exact sample rate is. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, ah, uh, geez, just a little touch like that would have been nice. But this is a great, awesome thing, of course. So this can go up to the time limit uh, enabled by the uh, 10,000 samples, uh, presumably. I haven't uh, gotten that far, of course. And it's great for long-term drifts and things like that. And you can see sort of like the display compression sort of as it adds data in there it's sort of yeah it sort of shifts the display because it's got limited pixels on there and it's got to um, do some you know it's got to figure out which uh, pixels to display in there and stuff like that but anyway it seems to work quite well and this is a really handy mode it's worth getting this it's worth paying extra for the uh, 6.1 model um, just to get this uh, uh, trend plot really and as I mentioned before, I think, we can still overlay the math stuff on there so we can get our statistics up with our trend plot as well. Fantastic! I love that. And uh, then if we go back in there, we can have our limits as well and we can set our limits in there and show it on the trend chart. Ah, thumbs up. Now, at first, I thought that this sucker did not have the ability to actually set a sample period here because you don't see any options. Like, it'd be fantastic to be able to go, OK, I want to take one sample per minute instead of just being the update rate of the analog to digital converter as it is here now, you know, twice a second or whatever it uh, happens to be. Like, one sample per minute or one sample per hour. And then I want this trend chart to go over, like, several days or even several weeks or something like that. That'd be fantastic. So it's not obvious how to do that. But if you go into the Acquire menu, you can actually set up your, uh, well, at the moment, the trigger source is set to Auto, um, but we, could, we should be able to set this thing up to 
uh, trigger or sample at a different interval. So here we go, it's auto delay at the moment. So if we go into manual delay, aha, look at this. Here we go, can we, yeah, there we go, milli. Let's go seconds. Oh, there, no, see, it's got this ridiculous entry mode again. Oh, for goodness sake. Ah, oh, 566 milli, no, 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 fail, fail, fail. Don't like it. Ah. Oh really quite annoying anyway I want one second god it's not rocket science second interval ah oh, crikey now it'll sample at one second intervals two three four five six all right beautiful and this is actually quite powerful because if the trigger source is coming from external, for example, then you can set the delay after an external trigger, uh, something like that. So if you're trying to synchronize measurements in a system or something like that, great way to do it. It's got excellent resolution in there, as you saw. It's uh, just fantastic. I'm not sure of the exact resolution. I mean, it goes down to, you know, uh, something ridiculous. But, um, uh, that, you know, there's got to be a limitation uh, somewhere. Well, maybe, you know, in terms of uh, timing, but seems very powerful. And, of course, you can set the number of samples it takes uh, per trigger sample. As well, you can set the um, output to be uh, positive or negative on the rear panel there. And if we want to save all of the readings that we've uh, sampled in this thing, not a problem. We can save it to internal or external USB. And I just checked the uh, saving of the data there to my uh, USB stick, uh, took it onto the PC there, and it saves it as a standard uh, dot, uh, .csv. Uh, file and uh, that and the values in that are of course the um, not the actual display value but the calculated uh, value from the single precision internal uh, math inside the unit so you may be able to extract whether or not it's valid you may be able to extract a bit more resolution by uh, sucking that da data out I don't know haven't looked into it and uh, by the way I should mention uh, the 61A has 10,000 readings memory the uh, 60A only has 1,000 and of course the trend chart we can just jump on over here if we don't like our trend chart I've set it back to uh, uh, the fastest uh, sample rate on six and a half digit we can then go over to our histogram and check it out once again we can jump between histogram uh, trend um, chart plus the uh, numerical display without losing any of our data that's great and here we get a uh, distribution plot of course that's what the history histogram is doing a distribution plot of our all of our sample data um, over the range and once again it auto scales here so we, we can clear that so we can start again and you can see it doesn't look like a any sort of anything at the moment but it's see it, it's changing the scale there as we read more once again I'm uh, just reading the noise from my microcurrent here this is just the noise hanging off that. So we expect it to be a, like, you know, that Gaussian uh, bell curve response. And if you leave it long enough, trust me, um, I've left this running for quite some time, and we get that perfect, you know, that sort of Gaussian uh, response to our noise there. And, of course, the different bins in here, this will uh, change. We'll, we'll notice this uh, change as we go on, hopefully, if we get some more uh, out oh there we go I just touched it I just yeah I just fiddled with it we got some outliers out there there we go and it's rescaling one thing it, it it tells you the number of bins here but it doesn't I mean you know we've got oddball values here you know because it's auto scaling minus uh, 17 microvolts to 6 microvolts here it doesn't tell us um, you know the uh, the width of the bin in microvolts it'd be nice if it was said you know we're 1.5 microvolts per bin or something like that that would be you know that would be useful I mean it tells us our center but you know I mean that's a trivial thing to add so uh, really I'd love to uh, see that and I don't know why they haven't added it but anyway we're up to like 208 uh, samples at the moment it'll go to 10,000 and then we'll get a rolling average of those uh, 10,000 we'll just keep on going once again a live display here yes we can turn on our statistics math on top of the uh, histogram there oh fantastic don't accidentally hit the clear readings button because you'll lose all your data you know that's one of the disadvantages of this you can't just lock it out or uh, something like that if you accidentally touch it oops you know You've uh, screwed yourself. Here we go. Uh, statistics off. Hide. There we go. We're back out. Now, one thing it doesn't have is like the ability uh, 
to go in there uh, once you've uh, finished all the readings, go in there and set cursors and zoom in and, um, you know, and tweak the display or uh, something like that. Now, unfortunately, we can't change our bin in here on the uh, fly. It's uh, auto at the moment, but if you go in there and you choose manual, well, it actually uh, just resets that. But you can set up all the bin stuff you want. Once again, low, high values for the bins, and then uh, center and span, and the number of bins, so you can fix it if you know exactly what you want. So there you go, I've manually fixed this now to be much nicer. Plus 50 microvolts, minus 50 microvolts, zero in the center there, and 100 bins total. And it'll just fix on that and continue to uh, change the vertical scale. Um, it depends, you know, on the number of, uh, you know, hits in that particular bin, so it utilizes the full screen. Once again, would have been nice to be able to maybe go to full screen mode, you know, jump out, you know, full screen, thank you, I don't know. A eh, small little nitpick. But of course, once this, uh, once all your data is captured and you're happy with it and everything, of course, you can press run stop and you can save it to your USB stick. But really, to do any analysis of this, well, you've got to go dump it to a PC and uh, do it that way. It's not like we can go in there and say, you know, how many items in that particular bin and blah, 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 and stuff like that. So, you know, really, you know, it's a nice visual um, display uh, tool. It's a, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. But any sort of detailed analysis on the data, not nah, you want to shuffle off to the PC. And of course, this is useful for seeing the distribution of your uh, references and stuff like that. So I'm actually looking at my um, uh, really high precision uh, reference uh, standard down here at the moment. So this is my resistance standard. And of course, I've just started. We're only up to you know, 140, 150 odd uh, samples, but once again, we can start seeing the distribution in there. We can start seeing that Gaussian distribution. Of course, one thing you've got to be careful of is when you're measuring precision uh, stuff like this, I mean, we're, we're talking a 1K resistor here, so the contact resistance, you've got to be careful not to touch any of this. So watch what happens if I, hey, there we go. Look, it just shifted. See that? The display just shifted over because it just, you know, added an, an, another item or two to some bins over here. And, uh, you know, really, um, you've got to be very, very... Well, look at that. I mean, you know, we're only talking a small amount, 999.991 ohms or you know, 1K. There, it, I mean, it's absolutely tiny, right? 1.000008K. I mean, absolutely tiny, but um, the contact resistance there was just enough to cause all those different bins. Of course, it, we're in auto mode here, so if you uh, set manual binning, you wouldn't sort of get that, um, uh, you wouldn't actually get that issue, though. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, once again, this highlights, um, you know, what is, what is, the width of our bin there, it doesn't tell you, right? We've got these oddball values here, 999.9991, blah, 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 all these zeros in here. You don't know what each value in the bin is. How hard is it to calculate that and display it? And of course, you can get a cumulative uh, display as well. So that displays the cumulative distribution function. If you turn that on, of course, that's uh, zero to 100 uh, 100% basically and it shows that we've got no bins out here so basically the greater the slope of that line indicates that there's more items in that particular bin and there's not much out here at all so that can be useful for those who need it and of course if we go into display here we've got our bar display mode as well for those who like a bar graph display and of course we can go in there it's default at the moment so it's just showing the actual reading duplicating that but uh, if we go into manual here, we can set the, once again, the low high uh, value of that, or we can go center and span. So we can actually go in there and, and let's do it. Can we, there we go, 1K, center, and then we can span a low value. We want, how do you bloody well do this? All right. We want a small value, so there it is. There it is, we've got a tiny little value like that, and that should, why isn't it doing what we want there? I don't see any way to get a center null on that thing either, so I don't know how handy this bar graph display is, quite frankly. Not, uh, not that impressed with that at all, it's a bit gimmicky. So check it out, I mean... Uh, Faults mode here, and you know, we've got a center and span, and we can set those values, but why it's not starting from there, and then, like, like, what's going on there? What's going on with that bar graph? Look, 
it's like, it's, it's stupid. I don't like it at all. It doesn't seem to do what I want. What the hell? Why is it showing sort of like a start over here, going to like a pointer at zero, and like, what's the point of that? I want it to be in the center, and then the bar graph to go boop, 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 back and forth with the center zero in there. Give me a break. Hopeless. Very disappointed with that. For that to be one of their big four display selling points, I expected better functionality out of that bar graph display. Maybe it's just a pebcack error, but I've looked at the manual and it doesn't really tell you anything more than what I'm already doing here, so I don't know. Ugh. Actually, the manual does show this thing starting in the middle and then going out like that. But I'm buggered if I can get it. What? Uh, there's maybe uh, I've got some firmware version that doesn't have it or something like that. I don't know. And check out if we go into the frequency mode here with bar graph on, then uh, it gives us a logarithmic uh, response on the frequency here. <laughs> I don't know if that's gimmicky or actually useful. Anyway, you've got three filters on here on the frequency, 220 and 3 hertz. And three different gate times, a second, 100 milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds. That will give you your most resolution. And just for kicks, I thought I'd hook it up to my EDC voltage reference here. And uh, I've got it uh, one volt uh, dialed in, and it was um, spot on 1.0000000 before. Uh, it's dancing around a bit. Depends how I do the connections down here. I can, you know, touch them a little bit. And, you know, we're really down in the noise when we're talking about the last digit down there. But it's basically uh, bang on compared to my um, HP 3457A uh, here, and uh, that's very, very impressive. Yeah, my Keithley up there is uh, fairly close to my uh, 3457A down here, but of course I'm going to trust this um, Agilent one better because it's in spec and it has a better um, spec than both of these units. Now, we're looking at, uh, you know, 90 day spec. I mean, I'm not a cow lab. This is just really mucking around here. We're not doing uh, serious measurements, but on the one volt range, the 34461A, we're talking 0.003% there, plus 0.007. We'll ignore the plus 0.007. We'll just go for the 0.003. And if you do the uh, calculation on that at one volt, that is um, three zero on the last, so it's the second last digit there, so that could be nine uh, seven zero, and it would still be within spec. But anyway, it is bang on, as you'd expect for these things. These things are typically well within the spec. I mean, you know, it, it's even well within the 24 hour spec, which is uh, 0.002% plus uh, point triple oh six so you know ah uh, not a problem why do i even bother testing that but a lot of people ask for it even though it's a pointless test on one unit with like ah uh, even if we we're at a cow lab what does it tell you whoop de doo it's within spec of course it is it's an agile bench meter for goodness sake and of course i can just dial up my last digit here and boy and look at that beautiful not a problem in fact let's take it up to 10 see what we get on 10 here and uh, there we go it's going to take a little bit to settle there but uh, it's pretty darn close look at that beautiful bingo spot on and if we flip that sucker to negative there <laughs> bang on and my 10k reference resistor 9.99943 let's compare that with the 3457a Yep, almost the same. Awesome. And if we check the resistance again on a Fluke uh, 5450A resistance calibrator, there we go. It's um, pretty darn close. Well, well within spec. Although, granted, I don't actually know the calibration uh, status of this sucker, but anyway, it's good fun. Now, let's see if we can see the power on uh, drift of my calibration standard here. So, let me switch this on, and then we'll clear this. So we'll start again, and it's in overload at the moment. It takes like five seconds or something to... Uh, so we can auto-scale that. Look at that. We can all already see it ramping up like that. Check it out. There we go. 
and it looks like it's well we'll have to auto scale that again quite nice you can see the turn on the switch on performance of this voltage reference this calibration uh, voltage reference standard here beautiful I'm going to uh, stop that and now we can capture that data and you've got to remember too we're looking at the least significant digit down in there and look it's not changing at all but we should be able to see something on our histogram and our trend chart there we go look at that we can see some little noise fluctuations in there so it seems to have greater resolution then uh, that was me um, just overloading the thing. Let me change that again. We'll clear it and we'll auto scale that. There we go. So it has greater resolution. It looks like the trend chart is showing the uh, single precision uh, floating point calculation from that uh, delta sigma like um, uh, true volt, um, oh, what is it, multi slope 4 conversion ADC in this thing. So there you go. So We'll uh, leave that running for a bit, and we should maybe we'll get a bit of a histogram going there, but you can definitely see it on the trend chart. Very interesting. So, of course, if that is the true uh, resolution of the ADC in this thing, we can actually see, even though that, um, you know, the main uh, display, the main number display like that, six and a half digit display is not moving at all, but um, if the ADC is actually better than that, um, then, of course, you know, it's not going to make a difference in terms of accuracy, but in terms of resolution and possibly the data you can extract from this thing uh, via the external, um, you know, via the uh, data, either, you know, the LAN or the GPIB or whatever, or when you dump the uh, CSV file to disk, you should be able to extract better resolution. Hmm, very nice. And here it is, I've left it running overnight, and let's have a look at all the data. This is just the recent one, of course. It, it looks like it is drifted a little bit. Let's have a look at all, and ha-ha, look at that. That's where we started last night. So this is like, uh, hang on, uh, how many records? It doesn't, uh, doesn't tell you. That's really annoying. See? Like, ah, oh, how many records have we got on there? It should be able to tell you that elapsed time, 16 hours, 15 minutes. And uh, anyway, um, there's, you know, there could be like 10,000 records in there or something. And uh, you can see it started up here and then it went a little, there's a little jump in there. It sort of recovered and it drifted down and down and down. A little bit more sort of noise in these parts around here. I'm not sure what's uh, going on there. You'd have to uh, extract the data and then uh, zoom into it, I guess. But uh, it's starting to recover back up like that. I mean, that could be a simple uh, temperature thing overnight as the temperature uh, drifted. I don't know. I would have had to record the uh, temperature with it, get some correlation. It's pretty good here in the uh, lab, though. It is pretty stable. So who knows? Maybe that's the just some inherent uh, drift in the uh, reference or the meter. I don't know. I haven't checked the specs to see uh, which one is uh, which one's going to uh, dominate there. But anyway, that folks is very fascinating and you can extract the data out of that and you can learn an awful lot. I just found one really annoying thing. I went to screen capture that again and it didn't automatically increment that number to two. I had to manually go in there and change the file name. I find that really annoying. It knows that there's already screen one uh, dot uh, PNG on that external disk. So why didn't it auto increment that number? Urgh. Anyway, what we can do is also have a look at the histogram for that because we're not going to lose our data. And there it is. Look at that. You can see multiple peaks there and how it's like shifted over and then given us another peak and another, and then it's continued to give us another one. So that is really fascinating stuff. You want to look at it and correlate with uh, temperature and other uh, drift parameters for the meter and or the uh, device under test, which in this case is a uh, calibration, a DC uh, calibration lab standard, then whoo, lots of analysis to be done there. I love it. And once again, you can see that the range here is not really huge. So we're getting, it looks like we're getting resolution above and beyond our six and a half digits there, we're getting that internal floating point calculation precision because it's not like the ADC uh, spits out a six and a half digit number. It actually, um, the internal uh, processor actually calculates a single precision uh, floating point result from that. So 
Uh, you know, you'd have to go into the complete operation of the ADC, whether or not it's valid, but I think you're going to get some increased resolution there from your ADC. Brilliant. And by the way, what's up with this 10 here? Look, we've got 10.0000 precisely there in the centre, and then it's got 10 up there. 10 what? 10 millivolts? 10 microvolts? What? What is it? I don't know. Is that some sort of bug? Urgh. And by the way, this is where you've got to be careful doing, uh, you know, really precise measurements like this. I just got, I was just uh, logging here. We're not uh, in all of it. There's all right there. It's been uh, sort of, you know, there was a period where I stopped it there and then it's been running overnight again. But uh, let's have a look just now, just like a, a minute or two ago before I stopped it. I came into the lab, switched the lights on and boom, look at that. Just be careful when you're doing precision measurements like this. You can get noise like that introduced, induced into your test system. Right, I'd better start wrapping this video up. I think it's been going for far too long. I think we're already at an hour already. So, um, yeah, I'll try and wrap it up as quickly as possible. Uh, I, as you no doubt uh, see, it's hard to fault this meter. It's really, they've implemented it really well, and you get a lot of confidence with this thing. Let me tell you, it's a excellent replacement for the 344-01A. Uh, it um, meets it uh, spec for spec, feature for feature, and adds a whole and add some new uh, feature set on there which uh, works really well a few operational issues with it of course but uh, eh, love the really big screen it's working fantastic but one thing that is lacking on here which we will get with competing units like the uh, uh, modern fluke and um, agilent uh, sorry fluke and rigol models is that um, they have capacitance measurement no capacitance measurement on here why in the multimeter for the next decade I don't know why they didn't add that. Is that there's some technical uh, reason why they couldn't do it well in the architecture or something like that? I know they wouldn't just add like a piss poor uh, cap measurement uh, to it. They wouldn't uh, bother doing that. But I don't know. Or is it just marketing said, no, we're not going to bother with uh, the capacitance mode. So if you need uh, capacitance measurement, if you want a full featured bench uh, multimeter for general purpose uh, stuff in your lab, then, well, this one may not meet your uh, criteria because of that lack of uh, capacitance mode. But in terms of, you know, uh, system functionality like that, it's not used uh, very often where this uh, meter is uh, designed to be used in, uh, you know, programmable test systems and uh, stuff like that. Although capacitance is very handy for, um, you know, uh, cable measurement and stuff like that. I've done a lot of work in that uh, area of uh, things, so this wouldn't have been suitable for that. Anyway, if you need that feature, you're going to have to look elsewhere. Now, yes, there is a fan in this thing, and yes, you can hear it, but no, it's not noisy. It's got a, I'd say, rather pleasant low-level uh, whine in it. I'm going to compare it to my Agilent uh, 53131A uh, universal counter here, and this one is much more noisier than this one. So, yeah, it's got a fan in it. As I said, you can probably, in the teardown, you could probably disconnect it. I'm not sure. I don't see this thing getting really uh, uh, warm at all or something like that, so I'm not sure how... Uh, useful the uh, fan actually is. Anyway, I've got my uh, shotgun mic attached here. I'm going to uh, stop talking, turn up the gain a bit, see if you can hear it, but it's quite low level. So in a silent lab, silent office, yes, it might dis be distracting, you can hear it, but in your general lab uh, with, you know, other instruments going, you really wouldn't notice it. I don't actually see a spec in there for the noise level. I reckon they should add that. Now if you compare the two models they got here, the 60A and the 61A, 945 US dollars and 1,095 US dollars. I'm not sure if too many people are going to opt for the 60A. I mean if you can afford near a thousand bucks, you can afford a thousand, uh, 150 bucks more and get the 61A. I mean you get the front and rear terminals, you get uh, better precision, you get faster readings, 1,000 versus 300, yeah, everything else, uh, your internal memory is 10,000 readings for all that nice uh, data logging stuff, and you get the uh, trend meter as well, and you get the LAN as standard on this one. Oh, man, this one's a winner. And on the AC measurement uh, side of things, bandwidth up to 300 uh, kilohertz, as we'll measure in a second, Agilent claimed to be the only ones to offer uh, digital um, RMS 
measurement instead of the old, um, you know, analog devices, RMS chip that's used in uh, most other meters. And then that, that they reckon they can measure crest factors up to 10 without additional error terms. Um, fantastic. <laughs> Let's see what the bandwidth is. I mean, you know, I'm not going to test crest factors and stuff like that. I uh, take their word for it that it's going to do that. Let's just do a quick uh, measurement, see if it goes up to 300 kilohertz. And here we go, I'm just going to feed in a basic uh, sine wave from the function generator, one volt uh, RMS here, nothing fancy, I'm at 250 kilohertz at the moment, so we'll uh, start from there. We're not after the absolute uh, reading on here, we're just after the relative uh, drop to see what, uh, what it does at the upper bandwidth there. So 250, we're up to 275. And of course, we're looking for the 3 dB point. We're well above where at like 330 kilohertz at the moment. There we go. It's significantly dropping off. There we go. 0 0.707, 350 odd kilohertz exceeds its spec. Now, I found an interesting problem while I was uh, just trying to do some more in-depth AC testing of that. I was trying to do this cardiac pulse here. As you can see, I selected this cardiac pulse at 1 volt RMS here on the Rigol and uh, DG4162 uh, function gen and you know here it is on the scope here uh, right and I've selected one volt RMS so you think it would do the calculations required to select the peak value and everything to output one volt RMS but look what I get on the scope here two different uh, measurement uh, techniques both confirming that it's around about 250 millivolts RMS and if we plug that into the meter here because I was wondering why I wasn't getting um, you know my one volt RMS and there we go around 242 I mean the scope's going to be a little bit out it's only got a you know a crappy little 8 bit um, analog to digital converter in there but look at that so there's something wrong with my Rigol function gen it doesn't seem to calculate the RMS value correctly oops and it's not just that uh, cardiac arbitrary waveform, it seems to be all arbitrary waveforms. Here's a uh, Gauss, simple Gaussian pulse like this, and we're getting around 551 millivolts RMS when I've clearly selected 1 volt RMS here, and of course the uh, Agilent 3461A confirms that. And of course, you're not going to get the same uh, 300 kilohertz frequency response with uh, anything but a sinusoidal, of course. So we'll find that this thing should drop, at, depending on the uh, complexity of the waveform. There we go. It's already started to drop and roll off like that, you know, at about 160 kilohertz. That's Furia for you. And if we have a look at the basic uh, specs here, you know, very impressive. And they're essentially identical to 3401A. Uh, they give you both that 24-hour spec and, like, the best it's uh, uh, capable of doing. And, of course, they'll, you know, proudly promote this as the banner spec of, you know, 0.0015% plus 0 0.004 uh, for 1 degree C in 24-hour uh, drift period, 90-day drift, 1 year. And what um, I haven't seen from the other manufacturers is... Agilent actually give you a two-year cow value as well. Fantastic. I love that for plus minus five degrees. So, you know, if you pick up one of these, um, you know, you can be pretty confident that, uh, you know, well here, well, here are your specs for, for two years. Unless uh, something goes wrong with it, it should be well within that. And, you know, the specs are very impressive, and I won't go through them. If they're, you know, have, you have to look at the data sheet and take it all into account. But basically, these specs are on par with the competition, which you look, you know, you're talking about like the Rigol DM 3068 here for 890 bucks, um, a bit cheaper uh, price point, and the specs are, you know, uh, reasonably um, similar. You're not going to complain. And then you've got uh, competitors like the uh, uh, Fluke 8845A, 46A. You know, you're talking 1500 bucks or something for the 8846A and thereabouts. And the specs are, you know, neither here nor there. They're Basically all equivalent, and of course you've got the uh, uh, Keekly uh, 2000 as well, you know, slightly, maybe slightly better on, you know, precision, but eh, it's neither here nor there. The specs of these things in these um, uh, price ranges are pretty much on par, really, and uh, drift and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely six and a half digit class performance. And if you do want to compare 
like uh, bench meat as well you know uh, go for your life I don't have the other um, units here this isn't a shootout but like I said like the fluke and the Rigol um, modern ones are both uh, offering capacitance measurement you know the Keithley uh, doesn't have that but it has might have slightly better DC specs I mean if you go for the fluke it's mega expensive at 1500 bucks whereas the you know Ag the top of the range Agilent uh, one here is you know under 1100 um, bucks so yeah I don't know the Rigol might offer a better bang per buck if you're after general purpose um, you know six and a half digit class bench meter uh, perhaps it's got trend plot in but you know the Agilent's got the best screen it's better than the uh, than the dot and then the small um, dot matrix vacuum fluorescent on the fluke and the small LCD on the similar uh, small LCD on the Rigol so in terms of just uh, you know, uh, sexiness and size of the screen and stuff. You know, the Agilent, really very nice and spec-wise, very competitive, of course, there. I don't know. Eh, eh, six of one, half dozen of the other. And we're just going to have a quick look at the Agilent Connection Expert. It came with a uh, CD. I installed it. Took a while, but it all worked out just fine. There's a little button uh, down in the bottom corner, which I can't show you unless I drag my capture window. Anyway, um, I just loaded up this Agilent uh, Connection Expert. And by the way, the software installs all the Visa drivers, LXI, and all the, the whole works. Um, and it's all embedded in there. But let's see if we can add an instrument. And... Uh, and it, this does that LAN USB. So I've got the um, meter in there hooked up to my uh, uh, local uh, lab internet here. So let's la add an instrument and we'll add a LAN interface. Let's see if this sucker works. And it does. Check it out. There it is. It sees my meter. There it is. So I'll select that. And I guess we click on web page, do we? Let's have a look instrument web page there we go we can directly go to the units web page awesome and here is the web page for it uh, that just uh, popped up no problems uh, whatsoever so we can go home here and here's our it tells us our IP address and everything else and let's go into the monitor system I've already loaded this up it requires uh, Java by the way so I you know it required my permission and all that sort of stuff but uh, there it is it's uh, measuring or <laughs> why it gives you the scientific notation there it would have been nice if it gave you the actual uh, you know the uh, screen value but anyway it gives you all the stats which is really good it shows you where the samples are at and that it's currently updating there's a bit of a lag there see that there's uh, it's not sort of updating in real time there but yeah you think it'd be fast enough to do that not sure what's going on there but uh, that's the monitor DMM and then we've got view data we can change presumably we can change the functions no this is observe only okay so there's some my ah observe only full control there it is so if we go into full control bingo graphics display oh here we go here we go it's loading ta-da you can view the screen that works brilliant not a problem I really like that number bar meter the trend chart there we go so we can get into our trend chart it'll download all the data I I haven't got it hooked up to anything at the moment so um, yeah it's just it's just sitting there reading the ether and uh, but that's really nice we can change the range everything it all seems to work we can change the integration time null out stuff limits we can do our histogram yeah it's all there fantastic thumbs up just works now if we view data here we can uh, get our data reading index 500 readings in memory so let's get the first 500 shall we we'll load that in bingo there they all are can we export that I don't know if we can export that or not I don't see an option to do that that's a bit of a bummer statistics history and clear data window get data oh poo and it's got like interactive I.O. and it shows the instruments you've got all hooked up to USB LAN. Presumably you could have hundreds of them all talking to each other in some test rack or something like that. And here you go for those who love their command line. Interactive I.O. Bang, we're straight in. We can add, we can uh, do, like an ID command. Let's send the command. There we go. We can read the response. And there it is. Now Agilent's talking to us. Nice. And here's the other uh, software which came with it. Or it kind of didn't like you got a disk which says that the uh, DMM connectivity uh, utility is on the disk but you load up the disk and it actually redirects you to the website I I can understand why they 
did that because they want you to download the latest version. But oh, it's and I think I had to log in to the Agilent website to get it. Ah, oh, really annoying. Anyway, it would have been better if they actually gave you a copy, even if it's a little bit outdated, on the CD which they give you. Anyway, here we go. This is the Agilent Digital Meter Connectivity Utility. This one is available as an iPad app. I don't have an iPad, so sorry, I can't try it. I wanted to try it on my uh, Android, but uh, apparently there's not an Android uh, version, but um, I will stand to be corrected on that. And I just refresh the instrument list. Once again, the instruments are behind me in the uh, lab there, connected to my Ethernet network. I didn't do anything special, didn't touch the uh, multimeter at all, just plugged it in, and it's found it, and there's a big play button. So connect, I haven't done this yet, and it's going to connect, hopefully. The instrument has measurement data in the internal memory. Do you want to upload it? You bet. All right. So here we go. We've got, yeah, this rather than, I I don't, I'm not sure if it gives you a uh, bench layer. You can have different, looks like you can have different, like uh, little uh, windows on here of stuff. So, and it looks like you can export the data. Okay, let's play it. And yes, I just checked the multimeter and it's locked in uh, remote mode now. So you can't actually operate the front panel because it's uh, talking to this uh, software. So you do everything via here. So yes, that is live updating uh, the data there. I've got nothing actually connected in there and we're in chart mode. You can also go to um, uh, display mode here. Once again, that is better resolution than what you get on the screen of the multimeter. I mean, you know, it doesn't have you know, a like a, a 10 microvolt uh, mode or a 100 microvolt mode or whatever. So it's using that floating point precision from the analog to digital converter to give you the extra resolution there. Excellent. And of course, if we go in here, we can change our mode. And oh, we're, we're locked. Looks like we have to stop it if you want to uh, change mode. Let's go to resistance mode. This auction will clear. Yes, we want to yeah, clear it and it'll start. There you go. So you can play around and operate the instrument, once again, you can null it out, do all sorts of stuff. Depends on what mode you're in. Data logging mode, digitizer mode. Really quite neat. Anyway, I won't go through all the details. The video has been long enough. Um, this software looks really good. And once again, you can run this on your iPad, I believe. And I assume um, that it will operate uh, in and look and operate uh, identically to this uh, PC version that I'm operating on my, on my PC here. So there you go. Um, both the uh, web based uh, software um, uh, worked on the instrument and also this uh, third-party DMM software. So it all looks really good, looks really professional. Not a problem at all. And we'll just quickly check out the um, export and manage data here. And we can see that there's already uh, two logs inside the machine of 1690. So we can open that. It tells you where the file location is, date and time. So let's open that data and bang, there it is. We can... Uh, replay all of our data that's fantastic this is great stuff auto scale it oh you can do looks like it's got everything including the kitchen sink there's our histogram fan ah oh, individual data and of course once we've sucked in that data then we can go back to here and we can export that into matlab format uh, excel format word hmm and uh, csv format and you can take screenshots as well and save those to file fantastic so yeah, sorry if this video has been a bit long. Oh, I ranted and waffled on a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of stuff to cover and there's some stuff I still haven't done. Haven't done a lot of the, uh, you know, PC stuff and talking to it and see what data, you know, rate you can extract the data out and, you know, all sorts of things. Ah, sorry, could keep playing around with this thing until the cows come home, but we've got to call it quits sooner or later. So how does it stack up? Well, you probably already know my verdict. Beauty, it is a brilliant, meter great measurement confidence with this thing it's designed and built really well a lot of thoughts gone into it um it is it seems to be a very good replacement for the 34401a which is exactly what they were uh shooting for and they didn't miss it's an absolute beauty love the big display few user interface issues which um uh, kind of annoyed me but you know who knows they might fix those in some firmware updates but no showstoppers so there's really very little not to like about this thing um yeah it's not going to be a meter for everyone you know some people might want a faster meter they might want something with a dual display which this one doesn't have they might want uh, some cat and capacitance measurement built in stuff like that so eh but that's what you know it can't be all things to all people but it's an excellent meter 
definitely gives the competition a run for its money and it's worthy of consideration for anyone after a six and a half digit meter because the price point is excellent. I don't know who would buy the 60A. I mean, if you're going to get it, get the 61A, really. You know, spend the extra 150 bucks and uh, get that because, you know, I think it's an absolute bargain. It's an awesome meter. I love it. Works well, measures well. What more do you want? It's built well. Ha! Huh, absolute winner. Anyway, if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EUV blog forum. And as always, if you like these product reviews, give them a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.